This is a video about how blood sugar levels are controlled as part of the homeostasis topic which comes up in paper 2 of AQA GCC Biology or Combined Science. By the end of this video you should be able to explain why it's important to maintain consistent blood sugar, describe how insulin and glucagon are used to achieve consistent blood sugar, and describe the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. When you eat a meal, large quantities of complex carbohydrates like starch are digested to make small sugars such as glucose, which are then absorbed in your small intestine into your blood. Without a control mechanism, your blood sugar levels would fluctuate wildly, and we can see this if we look at the unmedicated blood glucose level of people who have type 1 diabetes, where that control mechanism just isn't working right now. This can be really problematic for a few reasons. The first one is about maintaining consistent energy levels. Your cells need glucose in order to perform respiration, which is how they release energy. And they need to do this consistently, so you need consistent blood sugar. The glucose dissolved in the blood plasma is easy for them to access and can be immediately respired by cells, whereas the huge complex molecule glycogen, which is used to store that glucose in your liver and your muscle cells, needs breaking down before it can be used. If the blood sugar levels aren't controlled, then you can feel incredibly tired because your cells can't respire as much as they need to. And this is actually one of the diagnostic criteria for type 1 diabetes. The other reason that blood sugar needs to be controlled is to do with cellular damage. Early in the GCSE, you studied the movement of water into and out of plant cells in the osmosis required practical. And you saw how an imbalance in sugar solutions can lead potatoes or maybe carrots to either swell up or shrivel. Now that's fine for a plant cell because plant cells have strong cellulose cell walls which protect them, but animal cells don't have those, and so if the level of glucose in the blood rises too high or falls too low, then the cells can either plasmalise and shrivel up because all the water is literally sucked out of them, or cytolise and burst open because they absorb too much water. Neither of them is good for you at all, so it's important to maintain consistent blood sugar so that these don't happen. In order to control blood sugar and keep it at a consistent level, the small simple sugar, glucose, is converted into a much larger storage molecule called glycogen. And then when your cells need more sugar, the large glycogen is converted back into glucose. This is controlled by the action of two key hormones. Remember, hormones are chemical messengers that are secreted by the glands of the endocrine system and carried in the blood, and they're made out of protein. The two hormones we need to know about are insulin and glucagon. Insulin causes glucose to be converted into glycogen, and glucagon causes glycogen to be converted back into glucose. It's quite important here that you watch out for your spelling. Generally speaking in GCSE science, we will always give you the benefit of the doubt, and as long as we know what you're trying to say, then the spelling doesn't really matter. But I can think of three pairs of words where it's really, really crucial that you spell them right, because if you don't, then your examiner might not be exactly sure which biological term you're referring to. And this is one of those examples. So it's really important that you know the difference between the simple sugar glucose, the large storage molecule glycogen, and the hormone glucagon. Let's look now at the homeostatic control of blood sugar. When you have a meal, carbohydrates are broken down into smaller sugars such as glucose, which are absorbed in the small intestine into the bloodstream, and therefore blood sugar level rises. Receptor cells in the pancreas detect this change in blood sugar, and then glands in the pancreas secrete a hormone called insulin. Insulin travels in the blood around the body, and it binds to the membrane of other cells, increasing the rate at which they take up glucose. This leads the blood glucose level to fall. The glucose in your bloodstream can be used directly by cells for respiration, but when blood glucose levels rise too high and there's more sugar in the blood than the cells need right now, then the excess sugar needs to be stored, and this is when insulin is made. In this picture of the digestive system, you can see that the pancreas, where insulin is made, is a small organ that looks a bit like a leaf sitting underneath the stomach. If blood glucose remained high, then the cells of our body would start to shrivel, but if the sugar was inside the cells, then they would take on water and go into osmotic shock, which is where they might burst. So instead, the glucose is joined together to make a large, insoluble polymer called glycogen. And because glycogen is insoluble, it can't dissolve, and therefore it doesn't affect the water potential of cells, and it doesn't put them at risk of osmotic shock. This glycogen is stored in two main places, the muscles and also the liver, which is this very large organ in the picture of the digestive system. 
When you require energy beyond what you can currently get by respiring using the glucose in your bloodstream, say if you're exercising for an extended period, the glycogen starts to be broken down and you use about 80% of the glycogen in your muscles before you move on to metabolising your liver glycogen. When blood glucose starts to fall, either because it's been a long time since your last meal, or maybe because you're doing something very energy intensive like doing more exercise, then again this is detected by the receptor cells in the pancreas. And so in response to this, the pancreas is going to release another hormone, and this one is called glucagon. When glucagon is released, glycogen is broken down and the liver will start to release glucose back into the bloodstream. In addition to describing how blood sugar levels are controlled in a healthy person, you need to know about diabetes, which is a chronic or long-term non-communicable disease, which means it can't be passed from person to person, which affects whether a person is able to maintain consistent blood sugar without medical intervention. There are two types of diabetes you need to know about, and they're both caused by some part of the normal blood sugar control system ceasing to function properly. Type 1 diabetes is much more likely than type 2 diabetes to occur in young people or small children because there isn't an external risk factor. It isn't a disease that you get because of the way you've been living your life, it's a genetic disease that often runs in families. Although it's not usual for people to be born being diabetic, usually at some point during their childhood or early adulthood they'll gradually develop the diabetes. If you have type 1 diabetes, then your pancreas produces either less insulin or quite often no insulin at all. And this means that every single time you eat a meal, your blood sugar goes super high because the insulin isn't there to bring it back down again. And this could lead to you having seizures or falling into a coma. One of the really interesting things about type 1 diabetes is that when this happens, your body undergoes certain metabolic shifts where you produce new chemicals. And if you're interested in this, it's worth looking up Saving Luke, Luke and Jedi, which is a page for a diabetic boy and his diabetic alert dog, Jedi, who can literally smell when his blood sugar is going too high or too low, which allows him to medicate it before he feels unwell. The only way to actually treat type 1 diabetes is by manually taking insulin. And in the evolution unit, we learn about how genetically modified bacteria are used to produce this insulin. Many people with type 1 diabetes need to give themselves an injection every single time that they have a meal, although it's now also possible to have a pump fitted which can add insulin into your blood without needing to inject with a fresh needle every time. Type 1 diabetes is diagnosed on the basis of incredibly frequent urination and thirst. When a colleague of mine was diagnosed, he drank something like 10 litres of water in a day and was obviously peeing all the time because your body is frantically trying to remove the sugar from your bloodstream without being able to absorb it into your liver and make it into glycogen. You're also tired all the time because a lot of the sugar from your food is not being absorbed into the cells, so it's almost like you're only eating a quarter of the food that you're actually eating. And so you have no energy and you often lose weight for the same reason. In type 2 diabetes, it's not that your pancreas is no longer making insulin, but rather your cells just aren't responding to it anymore. So you can think of this a bit like if somebody asks you to do something and the first time you might listen to them, but if they just keep asking and asking and asking, then eventually you kind of start to tune it out. And that's what's going on here. Your pancreas is still making plenty of insulin, but your cells are just kind of ignoring it. And so that's harder to treat because you can't just inject someone with more insulin because they've already got plenty of insulin. It's the cells that are ignoring it. So instead we have to treat this with a carbohydrate controlled diet. So people who have type two diabetes are basically told to calorie count and to not have too much sugar and also an exercise regime because these things will help to keep the blood sugar more stable. A big risk factor for type two diabetes is obesity. So basically the heavier you are, the more likely you are to develop this. We'll finish now with some questions. So pause the video, write down an answer to each one and then we'll check the answers in a minute. A hormone is a chemical messenger. They're made out of protein and they're secreted by glands into the bloodstream. The two hormones that control blood glucose are insulin and glucagon, and these are both produced by the pancreas. If you don't produce enough insulin, then you might develop type one diabetes. And the fact that this is non-communicable is because it's not caused by a pathogen and so it can't be passed on to another person. You might be asked to answer questions about diabetes on the basis of a graph. So here is the blood sugar of two people labelled A and B, and they've been given a drink to drink that has 100 grams of glucose in it. So pause the video, read through the questions and see what answers you can come up with. It probably makes sense that when you drink a sugary drink, your blood sugar is going to go up. So the sugary drink has been drunk at one o'clock. There are actually four different things that we could have for the second question. So 
There's the fact that person A just generally has higher blood glucose. There's the fact that when they drink the drink, their blood sugar goes even higher than person B's does. There's the fact that it rises at a faster rate and then it takes a longer time for it to go back to a normal blood glucose level. Person A has type 1 diabetes, so they could be treated with an insulin injection. Thank you very much for watching. If you did find this video useful, then don't forget to like the video and also press subscribe below so that you don't miss out on more GCSE biology videos coming soon.